today we're going to talk about um, Bayesian reasoning. Um, and before I start talking about Bayesian reasoning, I want to revisit a little bit about planning for a second and talk about what were some of the assumptions that we had when we, when we went through the planning that seemed kind of unrealistic for a real world environment. So what were some of the things that were problematic about that? So we had some assumptions in that planning. And some of those assumptions, for example, were things where we knew everything about the world. It was called a closed world assumption. We knew what the state of the world was. We knew what the operators that could be applied in that world. We knew we were the only sub things that could change the world. And we knew when we applied those operators what the state would be after we applied those operators. So in general, there's no consideration of uncertainty. And we all know that when we go and we work in the world, we sometimes suspend our notions of uncertainty in order to make decisions. But we go ahead and make best guesses based on what we think is the probable outcomes. So we'll say, you know, we're pretty sure that this is going to happen. So given all the alternatives I might do, I'm going to choose the one that has the highest probability of success given what I want. Um, often that doesn't mean anything because we're so certain we don't even consider the uncertainties. But there are many times that we do have to consider those uncertainties. So the question is now, how do we bridge that gap between uh, having this very formalist of formalism of planning with those closed world assumptions and to extend that to be able to apply to real world situations where there is high uncertainty. One of the methods for doing that, obviously, as I've already alluded to by using the word how probable, is to use statistics to give you a sense of what is the best path to take in order to get something done. And we use statistics in lots of different contexts. For right now, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to go over a little bit of uh, statistics or Bayesian reasoning in this case um, in order to figure out the probabilities, uh, give you some tools for understanding those probabilities. Many of you probably have already had a background in uh, Bayesian probability. But we'll go through some, I call it uh, Bayesian 101, but it's really like Bayesian 0.25. It's not even that extensive. Um, but we'll go through those, some of those, uh, those operators, and then we'll explain how you might be able to apply them to handle certain cases of uncertainty. And then the next few lectures are going to be addressing this whole idea of how you're going to make inferences under uncertainty and how you might plan under uncertainty and decide actions to do under uncertainty. All right, let's go on. So as I said, today we're going to review probability theory. We're going to talk about Bayesian inference. Um, and then from a joint di distribution, and this is kind of a simple case. It's like the equivalent of, in formal logic, uh, propositional logic of having a truth table. Um, and then the idea of how you might go from that to something that's more computable when, those, when there are many more values there involved. We'll talk about how you can use independence and factoring to help you find those inferences and how you can reason from uh, sources of evidence. And then finally, we'll go into a description of Bayesian nets, which are, uh, uh, is a way of representing these complex relationships that are, is um, fairly intuitive, although it can be difficult, and also allows you to do uh, computation in a more efficient way. <clears throat> so as I said, there are a lot of sources of uncertainty in the world. Um, there can be, if you go to plan something, you may not know the inputs. You may not know the entire information that you need to know in the world. Or you may know it, but it may be approximate, it may be noisy. Um, you may, your model itself that you know, understand the world may not be perfect. It may not be perfectly enumerated in your mind. You may not know, uh, there may be multiple causes that lead to an effect, meaning that you don't know which cause. And, and it may not matter, but if, it, if you are going to do different things based on those causes, then it does matter. Imagine a medical domain. And if you had two different uh, diseases that caused something, but very radically different treatments, it would matter which cause it is, given the symptoms that you're looking at. Um, as I said, incomplete uh, enumeration of conditions and effects. What's the situation? What is actually happening? I only know partial knowledge. Sometimes they refer to it as partial observability. Um, incomplete knowledge of the causality of the domain. Again, poor models. Um, also on the outputs, uh, 
you, um, if you only have the outputs and you're trying to reason about those causes, um, then you're going to apply something that's like abductive reasoning. Now, does everybody have familiar with abductive reasoning? It's a, uh, well, no one's nodding, so I'll give a short definition. There, in, in formal logic, propositional logic, there's a notion of modus ponens, which is deductive. And that's simply that if you have the antecedent if A, then B. Uh, abductive would be uh, if you have B, if, if A, then B would be modus ponens. If you have A, then you have B. Um, if for abductive, um, if you have the rule if A, then B, and you have B, then you infer A. Now, that's not uh, valid in all cases, obviously. Um, so it is inherently uncertain, but you still work on that premise because you have no other way to work on it. Default reasoning, even deductive, is uncertain. Um, given that the world is a way, you can rarely actually have propositions that always hold true. Uh, the incomplete deductive inference may be uncertain. You may not be able to complete the, the, entire, uh, the entire causal chain that you want for that. Uh, probably wrestling gives uh, probabilistic results, meaning that, uh, again, if you have everything, all your alternatives always result in like 50, you know, like 51% chance that's your best one, uh, then that becomes a real factor that you have to consider whether it's worth doing at all. Um, but if things get up to high ranges and comfortable uh, ranges above some threshold, say 90%, you know, given what the outcome might be, then you don't care about them being probabilistic. You're willing to kind of subordinate that and say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and do that and just assume it's true. All right. Um, so what's a, one of the things you do with this kind of a, given that the world is uncertain, given that you're going to think about things probabilistically, uh, you have to think about what you want to do in terms of what would a rational decision maker. So we're going to try to model this rational decision maker. And so a, one of the rational decision makers would be, would be uh, so you look at each action, identify the possible outcomes. I'm considering a bunch of uh, actions, and I'm trying to figure out which one to take, given a set of outcomes. And I identify all those actions, I identify the possible outcomes, I compute the probability of the outcomes, and then I compute the utility of each of the outcomes. And then I do sort of a, a weighted utility based on the probability. And the one that gives me the highest, the action that gives me the highest weighted uh, utility is the one I would take. And that seems pretty much like what all of us would do when we're making a decision, right? All right, so we're going to try to model that. We're going to try to somehow come up with that, a mechanism that will represent that in our automated reasoning here. Okay, so really this is just a really simple thing. So why use probabilities? I'm not going to go into the epistemological ideas of why uh, probabilities are good or not good to use and what they, the semantics mean of them. Um, I'm just going to go through some simple uh, definitions here. Um, uh, Komogorov uh, showed that there are three simple axioms uh, to probability theory. That's that uh, probabilities will exist between 0 and 1. Uh, valid uh, propositions have a probability of 1. And unsatisfied propositions have a probability of 0. And the, the probability of the disjunct of, say, A and B is the probability of A plus the probability of B uh, minus the probability of A of the conjunction A and B. And the idea, the intuitive idea behind that is simply that if you say this probability plus this probability, and then you're subtracting out the overlap. Right? OK. So again, as I said, probability one, theory 101, or 0.25, or whatever you want to say. Um, essentially, it's made up of uh, several different uh, components. You have random variables, such as alarm, a burglary and earthquake, and as you will expect, you'll probably see these on examples throughout the slides. Um, these are just the random variables. Um, th in this case, they're Booleans, but they could be discrete, uh, and they could be continuous. All right? Um, an atomic event describes a state, a complete world state. Um, alarm, in this case, we have alarm equals T, burglary equals T, earthquake equals false. Uh, as a shorthand, in the rest of this lecture, you'll see this kind of denotation where alarm, if you see it like this, it means alarm equals T. Um, burglary equals T, and not, this not sign is the uh, earthquake equals false. All right? And I should say that these are conjunctions, if you don't recognize it. Um, 
A notion of prior probabilities are going to be given to uh, these variables. Um, a prior probability is that, now this is a real source of uh, debate and where they come from, in, in fact. Um, but a prior probability is the idea that without any degree, uh, without any other evidence, this is what we think the probability is going to be. Now you can imagine trying to figure out where you might get those from. Now if you have a great uh, experience with this kind of problems or these things, you might have done a lot of statistics, and a lot of inferencing, and then you might have come up with this. Um, a lot of times you'll see people, you know, try to, uh, try to, uh, um, they'll assign them based on some kind of intuition, but that's not very rigorous. Um, so this is constantly a challenge to figure out where those prior probabilities come from. Some may be well, well known that they're not, but a lot of them may be very difficult to find out. Um, and finally, these uh, joint probability matrix or tables, uh, and this basically is just like as I said, like a uh, truth table, is showing the probabilities given uh, these conjunctions. If you have an alarm and a burglary, then the probability of the two of them is 0 0.09 and so on throughout the tables. So this just gives you the probabilities given those conjunctions. All right, let's continue with here. So a little bit more interesting than those simple concepts, are conditional probabilities. And the conditional probability is this notion of saying, um, what's the probability of x given y? All right. So in this case, what's the probability of burglary given an alarm? Or the probability of the alarm given the burglary? All right. So what's, how, do you, how do you compute those probabilities? Um, so to compute those probabilities, you use this really very simple formula which is that the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. All right? And this piece, this piece here gets uh, turned around a number of different ways. You'll see uh, for different formulas that we're going to use in order to propagate our, 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 uh, our reasoning, um, our probabilities. So one thing to note about this is that this uh, probability of B, which is here, is considering what's called a normalizing constant. So often, if you're looking for a probability of A and B, and probability of C and B, and probability of D and B, um, probability of B will always stay the same. So it becomes sort of this normalizing constant. The idea here is that you have the probabilities of both these together, but since you've been given B here, you're going to divide by B, and since this is going to be less than 1, that's going to increase your probability, which you would expect. All right. So let me give you an example here. We have a, prob a probability of burglary and a, uh, given an alarm. So you look here for the probability of the burglary um, and the alarm. And you look up there and you say, all right, the probability of the burglary and the alarm is 0 0.09. Does everyone see that up in that cell? Um, and then you're going to uh, divide that by the probability of the alarm. The probability of the alarm is going to be gotten by this kind of marginalization rule here. And essentially what this says is that for all the other variables, uh, add up all those statistics, uh, all those probabilities for that, uh, um, for the, the variable that you're looking for. So in the case here, um, you see here, uh, what do we have here? We have the probability of the alarm. Probability of the alarm is in 0 0.09 plus 0 0.1 uh, because those are all the cases in which you can have an alarm on. So here we get the 0 0.09, as we said before divided by the 0.19. So the probability of the burglary given an alarm is 0.47. All right? OK, and this is a similar kind of, here's, the, I was showing you, but this is the marginalization that says, here's the probability of alarm. So you look at the probability of alarm given burglary, probability of alarm not, given not burglary, and that's where you get the 0.19. OK. So there's also, a, as I uh, had mentioned before, that um, doing that calculation for the uh, probability of condi uh, condition probability um, is that you have that uh, normalizing constant. And so one way of representing that normalizing constant when you're doing what's called relative uh, probabilities is you can put this alpha out here. And you can say this is going to represent what it means to be um, if it, it, for either to be the probability of the burglary or the probability of there not being the burglary, given the alarm. 
All right. So as we compute this thing here, we're, we're saying the here what we're going to do is the probability of the burglary and alarm in the earthquake and the probability of the burglary and alarm and not earthquake to go through the two different values that are not specified. And what we'll end up having is uh, the probability of there being a burglary with the alarm is, can be 0 0.01. Probability of there not being a burglary um, is 0 0.01, and that's in the case of the earthquake. And if we look over here, and we say, what's the case of the not having an earthquake? We have the probability as being 0 0.08 and 0 0.09, which corresponds to these cases here. OK? So if we add those things up, then we get this. We have the probability, again, of this alpha times, if there is an earth uh, burglary, um, it's going to be 0.09 times this. And if there's not, it's going to be 0.1. All right? So to calculate what this is going to be, remember that this is supposed to be basically, this alpha corresponds to essentially 1 over the probability of the alarm. So to figure out probability of 1 over the alarm, uh, we have to figure out uh, what the probability of the alarm is. And then uh, we get the probability of, of 1 over the alarm. And you get the 0.19 here. OK? As you can see, you can add them up. And that equals 5.26, which is uh, it, once you do the division. And that becomes the value of alpha here. And as we multiply those out here, in the case where we want to do for the first value, which represents when we do have uh, burglary, uh, we get the 0 0.09 times that. 4.74 if would be the probability of a burglary given an alarm. Probability of not having a burglary given an alarm is 0.526. And again, this is just substituting the value of alpha into this equation. All right? OK. So let's just go over some uh, simple cases here to make it a little bit more clear. All right, so queries. So what is the prior probability of SMART here? So what do you think would be ways that you would do the prior probabilities of SMART? So if you're looking at this table and you're thinking all the probabilities um, have to add up to 1, and you're thinking all the probabilities that have the case where SMART right, is it, then it's just going to be all these probabilities added up. right? Now it will be all the cases, that's going to be the probability of SMART. So 0.8, all right? What is the prior probability of study? Again, we look at this and we think, well, here's probabilities of study. Here's probability of study is true. So those two, and you add those up, and you get 0.6. So what is the conditional probability of prepared given the study, given study and SMART, all right? So we have here the probability of prepared and SMART and study is uh, divided by the probability of SMART and study. And we got that from our conditional probability formula, right? <coughs> probability of, of prepared, SMART, and study. SMART, prepared, and studied. OK, that's where we get that value from. And the probability of SMART and study. This is all the cases where the probability of SMART and study is. So then we end up with 0 0.9. All right? OK. So now we're going to introduce a new concept with this idea of independence. So the idea of independence is when uh, two variables don't affect the probabilities of each other. All right? So when sets of variables don't affect each other's probabilities, we call them independent and can easily compute their joint and conditional probabilities. So the independent, if, if two variables are independent, then the uh, conjunction here, which, is all, which we had shown before a derivation from the product rule, which is from the conditional probability rule, is that the P of A times the P of B, uh, they can be computed just as P of A, P of B. And if you notice here, if you have P of A given B, in the case that they're independent, because B has no effect on A, then the probability would just be P of A. So if you have no effect, then it doesn't matter if you're given it or not given it. It's just going to be the probability of that variable. So in this case here, we have some, imagine this example where we have this moon phase and light level uh, might be independent of burglary, alarm, and earthquake. Right? It may have an effect or it may not affect them. It may influence them or not. 
Maybe not. Crooks might be more likely to burglarize houses during a new moon, and hence a little light. So they might, if it's a little more bright out, it might be easier for the burglars. Uh, but if we know the light level, the moon phase doesn't affect whether we are burglarized. Right? Uh, if burglarized, light level doesn't affect if alarm goes off. Right? It has, doesn't have to do, um, the light level has nothing to do whether it's, it goes off. So you need a more complex notion of independence and methods for reasoning about these relationships. All right, so let's do a little, another exercise here. Is SMART independent of study? All right. So let's look how we would look at this. One of the things about that is it says, if SMART is independent of study, then the probability of SMART and the probability of SMART given study would be equal, right? Because this has no effect on the probability of SMART if they are independent. All right, so we know that the probability of SMART equals, uh, from our formula for conditional probabilities, is the uh, SMART, the conjunction of SMART and study, divided by the probability of study. So we look at the uh, probability of, um, again, we can compute this out, the probability of SMART and study is 4.32 and 0.48, SMART and study, right? And then we look at the probability of study over here, which are these, and we get 0.8. probability of SMART is, again, these here, right? This is all the case for the SMART. And it is 0.8. So since they're both 0.8, does that mean they're independent? Yes, they're independent. OK. So conditional independence. That was, that was what was absolute independence. Now we're going to talk about conditional independence. Um, in the case of absolute independence, um, you can compute uh, the probability of the conjunction by simply the probability of A times the probability of B. Um, if you have a, the probability of A, the probability of A given B is simply going to be the probability of A. Um, in conditional independence, it's a little bit different. Uh, d you have A and B are conditionally independent given C, some common cause. Um, if a and B given C, then that would equal the product of the probability of A given C and the probability of B given C. All right, it's a little bit different. Uh, this lets us uh, decompose the joint distribution of a large conjunction like this to be the probability of A given C, the probability of B given C, the probability of C. Going back to sort of a, uh, the way our variables in our example, if we have a moon phase and a burglary, then they would be conditionally given uh, the light level. They weren't, with, they weren't absolutely independent, but they were conditionally independent given the light level. And that's sort of like if you think about it. If you think about things influencing, them, they weren't, the light level didn't directly influence them. It was further back. So conditional independence is weaker than absolute independence, but it's still uh, useful in decomposing the full joint uh, probability distribution. All right. So here's another uh, little uh, ex exercise. Is SMART conditionally independent of prepared given the study? So in this case, just as analogous to what we did before, we have the probability of SMART and prepared given study should equal the probability of SMART and study times the probability of prepared given study. And that was just directly from the formula in the previous slide for uh, this conditional independence. So let's do this a little bit more here. Uh, let's uh, calculate that and see if this is true here, all right? So we look here and we say, well, the probability of SMART, uh, prepared, and study, which is here, um, over the probability of study, which we calculated in the previous slide as 0.6, and then we get the value of the probability for that is 0.72. Okay. Now we're going to do a look at the probability of, um, of SMART and study times the probability prepared and study. If you look at that, again, um, we've uh, calculated this from the previous slide, which was 0.8, and we calculated the prepared and study uh, given it from these things for prepared. 
And we ended up with 0.86, and we multiply that out at 6.88. So in this case, um, SMART, because they're not equal, uh, SMART is not conditionally independent of prepared given study. OK? OK. So now, that's some basic sort of low-level uh, probability theory. And we're having a, uh, another rendition where you can convert uh, that uh, conditional probability, the, the product rule, uh, into another form, which we call Bayes' rule. And the idea of Bayes' rule here is uh, that you can say the probability of a cause given an effect is the probability of the effect given the cause times the probability of the cause divided by the probability of the effect. All right. And we're going to apply this rule, and I'll show a number of examples here, uh, where you can start to infer, uh, the, you can get the probabilities uh, from these things to solve certain kinds of qu queries that you might have. Uh, often these queries are something like diagno diagnosis. So medical, for example, if you have a set of um, uh, um, symptoms and we're trying to figure out what the causes of those symptoms, you might use this kind of reasoning for that. Um, so if it says here, if E are observed effects and C's are the hidden causes, we may have a model for how causes lead to effects, which is a big deal. If we can do that, then that could be absolute, but some, with some probability, some credibility that you're going to believe it with. We may also have prior beliefs based on experience about the frequency of the occurrences of, a, of the effects of problems cause, which allows us to reason abductively from the effects to the causes. So the ideal here is that you don't always have you can't always pick and choose what information is available to you, but you'd like to go both directions. You'd like to be able to go from causes to effects with certain kind of uh, believability, credibility, and you'd like to go back from the effects to the causes. And you know, it's stronger in one direction, but you still would like to be able to make those kinds of abductive reasoning given that that's the information you have available to you. So here's an example from the medical domain. Uh, given meningitis M can cause a stiff neck S, Though there are many other causes for S2, we'd like to use S as a diagnostic symptoms and estimate the probability of meningitis given a stiff neck. That's a, something you can imagine wanting to do if you're in that domain. So what is available in this example is that there is a, a lot of studies that have given us a lot of the information about the probability of uh, symptoms uh, given that you have meningitis. So from that, they determine that if you have meningitis, there's a high likelihood that you're going to have a stiff neck. Right? And the probability of having a stiff neck is fairly low in general. You know, Probability of meningitis, fortunately, gratefully, is very low. Right? So when we apply, we can apply Bayes' rule here in order to figure out the probability of meningitis uh, given a stiff neck. So we're going from the effect to the cause. All right? And so we look at the probability of S of M here, and we have that, 0.7. Probability of M and the probability of S here. And we multiply that out, and we get 0.0014. So by applying Bayes' rule, we we're able to go backwards. We have this information from studies, and we we're able to go backwards and give a probability of meningitis given a stiff neck. Right. So that's part of the power of the Bayesian, applying a Bayesian rule. Okay. So the, the general idea of a, of, a, of a Bayesian inference is that you have some hypothesis up here, and you have a bunch of effects down here. And you're trying to see whether this hypothesis has what the probability of this hypothesis being true is. All right? Um, you have some uh, known prior probabilities. Those are the ones that you know uh, where they either come up from previous studies or from somewhere else prior to the model you have here. And you have conditional probabilities. There are rules that for applying these things. And you want to compute the posterior probability. And the posterior probability is that after you take these priors and you compute them through the rules in the Bayes' rule, and then you assign a probability to the hypothesis, that would be the prior, uh, prior probability. So Bayes' theorem, um, again, just to restate it, is Again, this idea of the probability, given a, given a hypothesis, um, given an effects, what's the probability of the hypothesis? 
it's going to be the probability of the hypothesis times the probability of the effect given that hypothesis divided by the probability of the effects. And again, that comes directly from just refactoring the product rule. You know, um, because if you if you can imagine, um, see if I dare do this by hand, but I'll try it. Um, if you can imagine that if you have you have the probability of A um, and B, uh, that's going to equal, uh, what is that? Uh, the probability of um, probability of A, uh, what is it? Probability of A times the probability. Wait a second. Probably should not have started this without a second. Now, well, let's see if I can get this right. <laughs> probability of A and the probability of B. If they're independent, it's probability of A times the probability of B. Say that again? Right. Probability of B given A. Right? Right. Okay. So if you do, and then this is commutative, right? So this can also be the probability of uh, B given the probability of um, A given B, right? Okay. And if you equate these things together and you uh, say you, um, and then you um, uh, divide by the probability of A, you're going to be able to get exactly this formula. Okay? So let's talk about a simple Bayesian diagnostic reasoning. Um, this is known as a na naive Bayes classifier. And the idea here is that you're actually kind of working on a very uh, simplifying assumptions on the problem. Uh, what are some of the simplifying assumptions? Um, evidence and manifestations are given as E to 1, the E to M. Hypotheses are disorders of H1 to HM. Note that EJ and HI are binary, true or false. Uh, hypotheses are mutually exclusive, so you can't have multiple hypotheses. And uh, they are exhaustive. So those are the simplifying assumptions. All right. So the conditional probabilities are uh, given the probability of the effect H, uh, E, uh, given H. Uh, the cases uh, for evidence, for a particular evidence, are all the evidence, e, E1 to EM. And the goal is to find the hypothesis with the highest posterior uh, probability. So the idea here is that you can look through all uh, the, uh, the, given the effects, and you're trying to then find the probability of the hypothesis of all your different mutually exclusive hypothesis that has the highest uh, um, probability. All right. So, expanding out Bayes' rule a little bit more here, um, we have the probability of uh, the hypothesis given the set of effects is the probability of these effects given H of I. And times the probability of H times the probability of those effects, which is actually what we had before, except we have multiple effects here. If we assume each of those effects is conditionally independent of the others, uh, given, a, given a hypothesis H of I, um, then we can just simply say that to compute this term here, which was up here, um, is simply the probability of E of J uh, for each one multiplied times each other because we've assumed independence. All right. If we only care about the relative probabilities, as I said, whether uh, H or not H, then we can factor out the, um, the uh, underlying piece and just take out the uh, normalizing constant. OK, so some of the limitations that come from a, a simple naive, uh, Bayes' naive classification is that it can't e easily handle a multi-fault multi uh, situations, uh, nor cases where intermediate hidden cases uh, causes exist, uh, meaning that if there's this kind of chain of things, it doesn't do it very well tracking down those things. It, it assumes this mutual exclusivity, um, and not and the effects are all considered independent of each other. So, if in the case here you have like disease D causes syndrome S, which causes correlated manifestations M1 and M2, they're not independent of each other. 
right? Uh, the second one is consider a, comp a composite hypothesis H1 uh, and H2, where H1 and H2 are independent. What's the relative posterior? Um, it's hard to compute that uh, given that you have H1 and H2. Uh, you can comb through all these formulas here and you come out with the, uh, the normalizing constant. Um, keep writing it down here. And then you eventually have this idea of you have to say, uh, what's the probability of this effect given H1 and H2? And you have to compute this at some point in order to get that value. The question is, how do you compute that? You can assume H1 and H2 are independent given those effects, um, but that's probably not very reasonable. Um, so, for example, um, if you have an earthquake and a burglar are independent but not given, but not given an alarm, then you know, this uh, burglar, uh, given, burglar given alarm and earthquake is going to be less than the probability of the burglar and the alarm. Another limitation is that uh, simple application of Bayes' rule doesn't allow us to handle causal chaining. Again, this is what I was saying about if you have sort of this A influences B, which influences C, um, you, don't really, uh, you don't really capture those, uh, that relationship. Um, another one is that you, so somehow in order to address these kind of things, you need some kind of richer representation uh, to model the, these, uh, these pieces. And you can't just do it as a simple uh, uh, Bayes naive classification. So just before we go into talking about Bayesian nets, let's just talk a little bit about what was this first part here. Um, the first thing is that probabilities is this rigorous formalism for uncertain knowledge. Again, I'm not going to go into the epistemological piece about whether it holds all the time or not. Um, it has proven to be pretty successful um, at modeling events. Uh, joint probability distribution specifies the probability of every atomic event. Uh, you can answer queries by uh, summing over the atomic events, which we've done. Uh, but we must find a way to reduce the joint size for non-trivial domains. Notice that those tables were all very small. What do we do when they're not so small, when there's hundreds of variables? So Bayes' rules lets unknown probabilities be computed from known conditional probabilities, usually in the causal direction. We'll talk a little bit more about this because this becomes interesting when we're designing our Bayesian nets. And then independence and uh, conditional independence uh, provide uh, the tools for, uh, in order to be able to do computing of these probability models. Okay. So. Given that we've tried this naive Bayes classification, and now we see that there are some limitations, and now we're trying to move to a more complex model, uh, a model that's more versatile and more general and be able to compute these probabilities, uh, one that's often done in, in particular in AI but elsewhere, um, are to represent these probabilities in these networks as a belief network or a Bayesian belief network or lots of different ways they're referred to. Okay. So what we'll talk about here is what a BBN is or our Bayes, uh, Bayes belief network is. Um, we'll talk about how to generate them and why they're useful for diagnosis or expert systems. Expert systems are production systems or rule-based systems. They're all the same terms. Um, planning and learning. The different, basically, you can do different kinds of inferences on those, on those uh, Bayesian nets. And those different types of inferences are what uh, you can leverage in each of these kind of domains. So what is a, a Bayesian net? Um, a Bayesian net is, a, uh, is a, um, a network, a DAG, basically, a graphical model of probabilistic relationships among a set of random variables. And the links uh, show, these direct links show influence. So this variable, influ rain influences sprinkler, sprinkler influences grass wet, rain influences grass wet. And then if you think of the, the, um, the joint distribution tables across them, um, you can see how these are computed based on these directed links. So in this case, because rain affects sprinkler, then rain becomes a variable in this part of the table. So, uh, here, rain doesn't have any direct links into it, so all we have is our prior probabilities. Right? Um, and in here, we have, again, another table, but because both of these affects it, then we have both of these showing up in the table to represent the probabilities given each one. Okay, so again, here's our Bayes rule. 
Um, uh, I didn't do a great job of it, but over there, that's the idea of taking the conditional probabilities or the product rule, and then you can reform it into this form. This allows you to go both towards from causes to the effects and backs from the effects to the causes. So you can imagine those links being able to compute values both directions. So here's a really simple uh, Bayesian network. Um, in this case here, we have um, smoking has is a variable of which it has these um, exclusive values. It's either no smoking, light smoking, or heavy. Um, here again are the probabilities of those. Uh, these are like prior probabilities. So 0 0.8 for no, 0 0.15, 0 0.05 here. And this has a direct influence on cancer. And the uh, exclusive values on, um, let me check exclusive values on cancer or that are none, is benign or it's malignant. All right? And given that, um, we compute this table from this, and we can say for each of the values on, on uh, the, ver the, the variable that, uh, the dependent variable, um, we can uh, calculate the uh, probabilities based on that. And that's what this table shows. So for each of the smoking, for no, light, and heavy, uh, in each of the uh, values for uh, cancer, none, benign, and um, malignant, here are the probabilities given those values. And that's a really simple um, Bayesian net. More complex one has uh, not all nodes being linked to each other, obviously. And so you have this notion of age can affect uh, the exposure to toxics and smoking. Gender can also affect the probability of smoking or smoking. These two can have a direct influence on whether you have cancer or not. And if you have cancer, the chances are you may show these symptoms and the probabilities of these symptoms. All right? So as I said, these nodes, each node represents a variable. Uh, the links represent what are called causal relations. Cause may not be the right way to think of them. It might be better to think of them as influence, influence of probabilities. Uh, does gender cause smoking? No. Um, but it does, uh, there is a uh, correspondence to it. Uh, that um, certain uh, one, and one gender uh, smokes more often than the other. Um, so it's better to think of them as influence. So the predispositions here is that if you have any of these factors, you might have a predisposition towards cancer. The condition is cancer. And these are going to be the observable symptoms if you have cancer. All right. So age and gender, as I said, they have no links. So they're going to be independent of each other. And as we've defined independence before, uh, it's simply to count, compute those probabilities is the, um, the conjunction of them is just the multiplication of them. Um, basically, this is just showing here uh, that uh, if they are independent, then it will all hold that you can do simply this. Um, because does it, the probability of A given G, if they are independent, is just going to be the probability of A. Probability of G given A is still going to be the probability of G because they are independent. All right. So cancer is in, independent of age and gender given smoking. Um, right, what this is saying is basically is that if you have the probability of cancer given age, uh, gender, and smoking, is going to equal the probability of cancer and smoking. So it's dominated by this factor. By, by this factor. Okay? Smoking dominates these two. All right. Um, here we're showing that uh, serum calcium and lung tumor are dependent on cancer. Uh, serum calcium is independent of lung tumor uh, giving cancer. Uh, so the idea here, again, is if you have a probability of Lung, uh, lung tumor, given that you have um, serum calcium and cancer, it's just the same as the probability of lung given cancer. Similarly, the other direction here. Okay. So naive Bayes' assumption and evidence is that the symptoms is independent given the disease. Uh, this makes it easier to, each one of these is independent, makes it easier to do that diagnosis. But that's in the naive Bayes model. Okay. Explaining the way, um, the idea here is that if you want to show uh, that you can try to figure out what's to blame, basically, 
for if you have cancer. Uh, here's a method for trying to explain this away. Uh, exposure to toxics and smoking are independent. So these are independent of each other, given that there's no link. Exposure to toxins is dependent uh, on cancer, given, I mean, on smoking, given that there is cancer. And the idea here is, again, is that the probability of, of, of the um, exposure being heavy and the uh, cancer being malignant is going to be greater than the probability of these three, of, of both heavy and malignant and heavy, because this is going to filter out also the ones that are just heavy. And not counting the ones that don't smoke heavy but do have cancer. Okay. So the way to think about explaining it away is that um, if you can, if you have a cause that gives you that symptom, then uh, sort of the rule of simplicity, or what's called Occam's razor, you know, try to simplify it as much as possible when possible. Don't make it any more complicated than needed. Uh, you can rely on that cause is enough to justify it. So reasoning pattern. Uh, where confirmation of one cause, in this case, if you, have the, if you confirm that cause, of an event reduces need to invoke alternatives, essence of Occam's razor. You don't need to look at the other ones if you already have a single cause. OK. So conditional independence um, in the Bayes net um, is confined to the, uh, direct, um, um, the direct parents and descendants of the uh, of whatever node you're looking at. So um, non-descendants here are, would be age and gender. Uh, the parents would be the exposure to toxins, smoking, this is to cancer. And the descendants would be serum calcium and lung tumor. So cancer is independent of age and gender given exposure and toxins to smoking. All right, so you look at the direct line here. Um, another one that would be independent is this guy over here. So a variable is conditionally independent of its non-descendants given its parents. So given these two, not only are these uh, independent, but also this one would be independent too. Cancer is independent of diet, given exposure, and uh, toxics and smoking. Okay. So now the question is, how do you make a uh, Bayesian belief network? You, know, you have this idea of how it works. You have this idea of how you can represent it. But how do you, how do you generate one? You know, so what are some general guide rules for this? So there are, um, there's sort of this knowledge acquisition problem, right, where you have to go out and you have to find out in the world sort of the model, the structure that you want the topography of the graph to be, the network to be, uh, some of the priors that you want, uh, what representation you want to do, what resolution you need to do this at. So here are some, uh, some guideline steps for that. Uh, three guideline steps. Choosing the appropriate variables, deciding on the network structure, and obtaining the data for the conditional probability tables. Okay. So a general rule about uh, choosing the variables is that you want the variables to be comprehensive, uh, that are pertinent to the model, to whatever you're trying to solve. You want them not to overlap. You want them to be uh, separate, and you want the values uh, to be mutually exclusive for each of the for each of the variables. Example of good variables would be something like weather, would be uh, sunny, cloudy, rain, snow. Again, those are all mutually exclusive values for weather, hopefully, unless you're in some kind of biblical storm. Um, gasoline, uh, cents per gallon. Temperature, here you notice that we've done some binning here or discretizing. Anything above uh, uh, 100 Fahrenheit, anything uh, below 100 Fahrenheit. User needs on Excel charting, yes or no. Um, user's personality, dominant or submissive. All right. These are all very, these are discrete values. There are ways to do a continuous, which I'm not going to address now, but know that there are ways to deal with uh, continuous uh, values. Okay. So next is to figure out how to structure, you know, you figured out your variables, which are each of the nodes. Now you have to figure out how to hook them together, how to make the net, what's the structure of that net. And sort of a common uh, principle is this notion of causality. And by causality, it means, you know, the age um, causes this, uh, gender causes smoking, age can cause that. Um, these are basically, it's like, a, almost think of it like as a model um, that you're putting together here. If you get it wrong, you're going to get um, very wrong answers. 
So it's important that you get these relationships right. Um, but as you notice, um, it may be that as you work with a net, I've seen this happen before, is that people work with nets, then they realize they're getting values that are inconsistent with what reality is, and then they have to restructure their nets because they realize they have the wrong thing. The other thing you have to worry about is that you have all your the nodes. If you don't have all the variables, then that's also going to be, if you're missing an important piece of it, um, you're not going to do it. So there is a very big knowledge acquisition piece to building the net. And it's hard. I mean, often uh, you don't have everything. You think you have everything because you trained it on, you tried it on all your test examples, you think it's comprehensive of that, and then you're confronted with a real world problem which is outside the scope of it. Okay. The last thing you have to worry about is sort of the um, fidelity of the model. I mean, how, how, what, what size, what, what do you want the probabilities, what is important? If all the probabilities are within, you know, uh, one thousandth of each other, then, then you need that third digit there in those probabilities. Uh, you, you have to be concerned about what level of the fidelity you want the model to be at. So that's just going to be familiarity with the numbers and knowing what the differences are. Okay. So suppose now that we've built this Bayesian net and we want to figure out what we can do with it. How can we use it? Um, there are uh, different types of reasonings that are supported by the Bayesian net. There's Prediction, as we've seen, uh, predicting is uh, conditions given uh, predispositions. So, given that you are exposed to toxic waste or you're um, smoking, uh, then you can get the predisposition, the probability of having cancer. Diagnosing is if you see somebody has a stiff neck, for example, uh, can you come back and say what's the probability that he has meningitis? Uh, explaining away is trying to figure out what might be the causes for a particular kind of symptom or condition. And finally, the one that you ultimately do this in particular in planning is you're going to try to decide based on those kind of inferences uh, what's, the, uh, what's the right action to take based on the probabilities of these conditions. All right, so uh, predictive inference is, as I said before, is how likely are elderly males to get malignant cancer? Um, so, if we have uh, a notion of here of age and gender, and we, here's the uh, BBN we, we have, uh, then we can say, what's the probability of, of uh, the condition being malignant, given that you have age over 60 and the gender equals male? So this net will allow us to compute these things. Um, there is an algorithm, actually uh, multiple algorithms, a variable elimination algorithm in the book. Uh, that can talk to you about it, but basically it's just multiple applications of the Bayes rule across these nodes in order to get those probabilities, and you can then get that given the, if you have uh, the priors of these pieces, of these uh, variables. The other kind of, uh, you can imagine, is that they're not distinct of each other. You can imagine some kind of a hybrid where you're doing predictive and diagnostic uh, combined. So you might ask, uh, based on what's the probability of getting cancer based on some part of age, some part of gender, and whether you've seen any of these kinds of effects or these symptoms, for example. So here we say, what's the probability of uh, cancer being malignant, given that the age is over 60, the gender is male, and the serum calcium is high. Right, so now we're going both this way and that way. Okay, so explaining the way, if we see a lung tumor, the probability of heavy smoking and of uh, exposure to toxics both go up, right? So if we say here we see this with, you know, probability of one, it's going to propagate up and it's going to increase the probabilities of these. Okay? If we then observe heavy smoking, all right, that's going to drive down the probability. I mean, it's going to, uh, this will explain a way that this is a likely cause of that given our Occam's razor, and we're going to lower the probability of seeing this. Right. Oh. In the future, we got to remember to turn it off before we turn it back on. And this happened twice now. I've, I've made the mistake. I vowed that I would remember. Of course, I did not. But it's all right. So let me. Um, and unfortunately, there's a a time for the heat that goes off. 
So I think according to this, it's probably going to take like three or four minutes to go down. So let me just continue here, all right? And we'll try to come back. So um, the idea here is, <laughs> great. Um, the idea here is that there is, um, given these kind of nets, you're going to do some kind of decision making, um, as I said. And you can do it based on this kind of prediction, um, based on the diagnosis or the combination of those two, um, um, explaining the way. You know, you've made some kind of inference from the Bayesian net, and now you want to make, take some action based on that. And what do you want to do when you want to take that action? Well, the idea here is that you want to try um, to kind of maximize your probabilities. I said very in the beginning of the lecture, Pro maximize your utility. And the utility is going to be affected by how likely that outcome is going to be, you know, how likely it's going to be. So what you can do is, is you have these hypotheses that you're going to have in the Bayesian net, and you're going to try to uh, quantify based on the, uh, weighting the utility on the probability of that possible outcome, uh, which one is going to give you the most likely uh, step that you want to take, uh, given, given some action. All right. All right. Let's see what we got here. Wow, it really works. OK, so as I said, we're going to have to do uh, some kind of decision making. Um, and in order to do decision making, we're going to have to sort of, um, we're going to have to do something a little bit more to the, um, to the uh, Bayes net in order to invoke this notion of utility. All right. So uh, decision, when you take a decision, it's this irrevocable allocation of domain resources. You're going to take an action. You're going to do something. You're going to use some kind of resource to do that. Uh, the decision should be made so as to maximize the expected utility. And as we define, the expected utility is this kind of weighted uh, utility by probability of an outcome. Uh, view decision making in terms of the beliefs and uncertainty. How much do I believe that cancer is the problem of diagnosis? Uh, alternative decisions. Uh, if I did this, it would have a probability of that happening. If, if I did this, it would have a probability of that happening. And sort of the objectives and utilities in general. Right? All right, so here's a really simple uh, kind of decision uh, uh, kind of tree that you would see. Um, I'm trying to decide whether I should have my uh, party inside or outside. If I do it inside, uh, you know, I mean, you can imagine this. I'm, uh, it's not very hard. I remember going through this exact thing when my daughter had a bat mitzvah, and I was like, trying to say, oh, it's cheaper outside, but you know, don't tell her I said cheaper. But anyhow, anyhow, so, so you, you're, you, if you do it inside and it's dry, you have regret because it's beautiful outside. Um, if it's inside and it's wet, you know, that's pretty good. That's, that's not may not be optimal, but you're pretty happy at that point. Um, if it's if it's dry and it's outside, you know, the fates aligned. Everything was great. I, I was perfect. Um, and if it's out in the wet, that's the worst, right? That, that, that blue. So here's the kind of thing that you want to think about. Now you want to have this Bayes net that will allow you to support making a decision in that, given, say, the forecast, right? So the first thing you want to do is uh, give some notion of utility uh, to uh, those, those end states. So here are the end states. I'm inside, I'm dry, and I'm just going to use dollars, but it can be anything you want here. So it's like 50 bucks here, 60 bucks here, 100 bucks, and zero bucks there. All right, so I'm just assigning utilities to those end states. Just uh, by way of mention, and it's kind of a fun thing if you ever want to play with this kind of thing, is that there are uh, multiple different uh, free um, or somewhat free with limited limitations of how, much, uh, how many nodes you can put in the net uh, tools out there for playing with Bayesian nets. All right, and here are two. Two ones that you can use. Um, again, you can play with. Um, 
these are just they as I said this one's a commercial one and you can get a free one but it has a only small networks you can use a huge number of nodes here's another one where uh, uh, again this allows a, a building of whole engine and so this allows does the computation of those things so what you're really doing is specifying the net and then entering the problem of the probabilities so I'll go through some, a couple of little examples here given the weather so here's an example of the um, Netica um, where again we're just showing here um, these are the, the predispositions in Etica where you have, uh, you know, visit is, uh, doesn't really happen much here. No visit is one. That's the priors to this. Um, smokers, 50-50 here. And those are the predispositions or the causes. Here are the conditions or the diseases, tuberculosis, lung cancer, bronchitis. Given the priors that we saw up here, here are these things. This thing is what's called a functional node. It's basically a way of saying that you can treat these as the same in terms of these kinds of things. They'll both display so we can combine them so we don't have to have each separate one. Um, and then the symptoms are the effects. You know, x-ray is the results, the normal uh, 89 in the case of this, if this is true. And uh, dyspnea, uh, again, will show this. And again, this is just the way that you can model it. And you can enter the information into this and the system, and it will do the computation of the nodes back and forth. Okay, so let's go back a, a little bit different weather one. So uh, decision making with BBNs. Uh, today's weather forecast might be either sunny, cloudy, or rainy. All right. Should you take an umbrella when you leave? So that's the decision that you have to make. All right. So it's going to be a planning action if you do do it, but you're trying to figure out whether you should do it or not. Your decision depends only on the forecast. The forecast depends on the actual weather, right? So, of course, forecasts are not going to be 100% uh, reflective of what the weather actually will be, right? And your satisfaction depends on your decision and the weather, whether I take the umbrella or not, and whether it actually rains or not, right? So I, I assign a utility to each of the four situations. Uh, rain, uh, not rain, by umbrella, not umbrella, those, each of those combinations. And then I'm going to extend the, uh, the Bayesian belief network framework to include two new kinds of nodes. And uh, one is a decision node, and the other is a utility node. A decision node computes the expected utility of a decision given its parents' forecast and evaluation. All right, it's basically going to figure out, given the evaluations, um, it's going to figure out uh, what the probabilities of, of those states are. The utility is going to compute a utility value given its parents a decision and a weather. It's going to tell you what actually happened. If I took this decision and I had the weather like this, this is what's actually going to happen. We can assign a utility to each of the four situations, as I said before, and the value assigned to each is probably subjective. So in this case here, um, if we have 70%, uh, not 70%, this is a probability of 70 uh, that there's no rain and there's a probability of 30 that there is rain. And of course, that's 0.7 and 0.3. But in Medica, they're represented from 0 to 100. Um, probabilities of, in the forecast, the forecast says it's 53.5%. There's a cloudy, is 21.5, and rainy is 25.0. And Propagating down, the probability of uh, taking it is 35. The utility of taking it uh, at home is 70, and based on this satisfaction. And this satisfaction node looks at like this. Here are the valuations that we've assigned to each of those states. Um, and rain, no take is 20. No rain, leave it at home. That's great. Rain, take it. I'm very happy I did that. Rain, leave it at home. That's really bad. Right? So... If we look at this and we say, given the forecast, uh, we make a decision here based on this forecast. And we see um, that it's, if it's sunny, what you should end up doing is leaving it at home. right? And in those rare cases, it's very low probability that it's going to actually um, rain. Here, if it's cloudy, a little bit different here, um, we've now uh, taken this no rain it's a little bit more likely it's going to rain. Um, it's a little bit closer here. And uh, it still says, leave it at home here. All right? But we're taking a risk. That's going to maximize the utility. 
And finally, if it's rainy, um, this is going to switch. It's kind of interesting here. Uh, um, the rain is 72% over here, but the forecast is 100% over here, right? So I'm a little, uh, you know, you, you got to wonder about the weights in the model here because I, I think that I would be more risk averse. And that if I thought it was going to be 100% chance of rain, I'd, I'd want to see it much higher probability here. Right, that, I mean, much value estimate that I would be, I would definitely want to take my umbrella. So that's probably an error in the model and the very evaluation of the model here. So that gives you a sense of where some of the problems can be. All right. So let me, um, let me, let me uh, just kind of summarize a little bit here. And that is that um, we went through and we gave uh, a notion of using probability in the case of try to handle this big, giant elephant in the room, which is uncertainty. And we're using it, what we talked about today is about a way of using that uncertainty and those probabilities to model the uncertainty and then to make some reasonable um, uh, deductions or abductions about that, those, uh, the model given the uncertainties. And the probabilities allow us to do a lot of these kind of inferences. The inferences based on uh, prediction, uh, given a sense of a set of causes, we might be able to say this is going to happen with a certain probability. Uh, we do this kind of abductive reasoning, which is uh, given a set of uh, effects that we see out there, say symptoms. We can then talk about a condition that might have led to that, um, and then we can make decisions based on that condition. So if we know that if you have cancer, then you're going to do a certain, pursue some kind of treatment plan, or you're going to, if you think you have cancer, you might pursue some kind of a diagnostic uh, test. And again, um, that's what the probabilistic reasoning is trying to give us, is this way of doing these inferences. We introduced the Bayesian nets uh, as a way to um, uh, kind of intuitively represent these models and also to make it computationally uh, not overwhelming. If we had to do everything in terms of those uh, joint uh, uh, tables, uh, then it would be uh, very difficult to do that. So these, the relationships and the direct independencies and the conditional independencies um, are all related, are all captured in those Bayesian net models. Um, so that gives us all the power to do that kind of inferencing. Um, in the future, uh, what we'll talk about is ways that we can uh, use uh, other ways of addressing uncertainty. We'll be talking about, for example, uh, planning under uncertainty, um, where you, not just in the simple case, not really simple case, but not just in the case where we're trying to pick um, an action based on some evidence and probability of an outcome occurring, but also um, on all the, the things that may go wrong as you're trying to execute a plan. So we'll be exploring uh, what are called Markov decision process, uh, MDPs, and they, of course, have different versions themselves um, in uh, different environments, whether it's observable or not observable. Um, and the idea of those kinds of uh, planning models is that given um, a state that you're in, you want to have an expected optimal path to your uh, solution. And you may, when you actually go to execute it, you may, even though you thought that by taking some action it was going to put you into some state, in fact, it may put you in another state. But these Markov decision processes will give you these transaction vectors, which will capture all the states. So even if you go off state from that other state, it's going to still try to pick another uh, optimal path to go from that. So it tries to be resilient against the uncertainty that happens during the execution. Um, so again, it's that you, uh, cr you're creating a plan based on what you think the probable outcomes are, but also then trying to be resilient about it when it doesn't actually uh, fall under those paths. Um, I guess with the last five minutes, um, I can, we can talk just a little bit about um, uh, uh, something that we didn't quite address uh, in planning, which was uh, we had gone through at the very end of planning, we had talked about uh, ways of de dealing with uncertainty uh, in terms of having contingencies in the plans, branches in the plans. And we had also talked about doing um, conformant planning, which was this idea of forcing the environment into a position where you can't fail. So the, the example I gave you was a trying to make two chairs the same color. One way is to try to observe what the color of one of the chairs is and then paint the other chair that color. But another one would be paint both chairs red, for example, and you force the environment and have no uncertainty about it. So one of the other pieces that comes up for that is uh, that um, 
when you go to uh, often uh, in all these cases we've talked about is centralized planning and in centralized planning um, frequently most of the times you have as much visibility as you're going to have of the, of the planning problem doesn't mean that you have all visibility but you but you're centralized here when you go to uh, decentralized planning uh, due to bandwidth uh, limitations and things often not all agents if you think of a plan being cooperative among a bunch of agents um, will have a viewpoint on that plan so each one only has sort of its own view of its part of the plan and as a result of that um, there's another kind of uncertainty that gets introduced um, which is this kind of partial observability of these plans and that they have to coordinate across those plans uh, you often see those one of the things you saw that kind of planning done was in the uh, disaster relief uh, uh, where they go out and they try to uh, help people who are, are victims of uh, natural disasters and um, organizations have uh, and teams that go out and actually do this uh, don't know what they're going to expect to see and so you have this notion of discovery and then needing to push that discovery of information you know what's broken who's hurt those kind of things out to other agencies such that they can send resources in order to help them so you can see how this uncertainty starts to pervade everything and as you go to more complex more realistic models of things that happen in the world um, they start to degrade um, and so having these uh, belief networks are helpful but again they're limited because often you just don't have enough information even to assign probabilities to those things so not that these things aren't good for a number of problems but there are problems that are even more challenging than these so everyone uh, have a good uh, spring break I think uh, probably graduate students are not going to have it but that's the way it should be um, I'm not going to have it either so you can leave that too all right thanks everybody <laughs>